should be good to watch. Yeah, some notes here if you do know the Jeff Hoagland deck lists. Uh, guy has taken only minor changes to it. As opposed to the Blighted Fen package, he has gone for a three-color mana base so that he could incorporate four Painful Truths into the deck. Uh, otherwise, though, this is pretty much a copy of the Hoagland strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, Handy's list is not exactly the stock list for Rally. You know, she wrote about this piece this week. Uh, she's not big on Ailey Eternal Pilgrim. There is one copy in the sideboard. There are no copies in the main deck of the 2-3. Fetch land for Guy Scott's going to be an evolving wilds for Emma. And this black white control deck is it, it, it's pretty interesting. I you know, it's general concept playing four copies of Seeker of the Way, one copy of Kalidus as its only creatures in the main deck. Um, it seems like a mid-range deck, though, if you haven't seen it before. Cards like Secure the Wastes, Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, and then Soren, Solemn Visitor are the way it really turns a corner from killing creatures uh, into killing the opponent. Yeah, Secure the Wastes into Gideon is one heck of a fireball. <laughs> of course, Handy Deck also has one heck of a fireball in Rally of the Ancestors. So, Handy there, a shortcut that we often see from Michael Majors as well, <laughs> having fetched the land to save time, keeping it face down, and then revealing it at end of turn. Especially with these four-color rallying control decks in standard, always being cog conscious of the clock is a strength. Absolutely. Jace Rins Prodigy will be the play. Will be taken down by a copy of Grasp of Darkness. Yeah, those are probably the best scripted turn two plays for both players. Uh, for Emma playing a Jace, for Guy killing Jace. Yeah, not actually too many spells that can just kill Jace and step onto uh, Grasp of Darkness card out of Oath of the Gatewatch. Yeah, very efficient removal spell. It's actually a reprint. Um, uh, didn't see a ton of standard play before. Seems pretty good in this format. Doesn't kill Siege Rhino, but kills most everything else. Yeah, and Guy Scott doing a great control job. Gassing back up with a turn three Painful Truths. That's all three colors of mana. He'll draw three. And now the first creature will stick back on Emma's side. Is it the copy of Catacomb Sifter, bringing in an Eldrazi Scion? Catacomb Sifter is actually just a creature with a very good rate. Uh, this is really the only deck that plays it, uh, but it, it's a card that's just fine as a green-black card. And if it weren't for four color mana bases, you actually might see it in more decks. Yeah, well, it is a 3-4 three, for three if you add up all the pieces of it. That also accelerates your mana and scries. So we go back to Guy, though. Now his first threat on the board, copy of Gideon, ally of Zendikar. Speaking of good rates. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Gideon is among the most powerful cards in Standard, obviously. Uh, we don't need to explain that one to anybody at this point, I don't think. You look over at Emma's hand, she's picked up a copy of Rally the Ancestors, also a copy of Collected Company. It looks like that's going to be the play here. So a Scion is sacrificed, Collected Company cast here. She's keeping the Scry trigger on the stack and then casting the Company in response to it. So when she's done looking at these top six, she'll get a Scry of one. Great sequencing there. Um, the Scry is not going to do you a whole lot when you're just going to go past the card one way or the other on the Company. You expect to find two creatures. You're not too picky at this stage in the game over which ones they are. So the Scry is going to do a lot more for you here after the Company. Sadisi's Faithful and Nantugo Husk were the finds off Collected Company. The Faithful was exploited to itself. That unsummons the ally. Catacomb Sifter swings in and puts Gideon down to two. Yeah, getting getting off the table is um, not necessarily super important for the rally deck, though you would prefer that it's not in play to being in play. Yeah, I mean, as long as no one's taking damage, that seems like it would be in the in the favor of the four color rally deck. They're kind of plan. The plan we see frequently out of them is that they'll assemble a mass of ground troops, they'll shump block a lot, and then finish with some sort of game ending spell. Yeah, a lot of people think of Rally as a strict combo deck, but uh, a lot of the games you just win by uh, attacking a lot. And Gideon is a big imposition on that game plan. Seeker of the Way is the play from Guy. It's joined by a 2-2 ally. And he will pass the turn back to Emma. Emma with two copies of Rally in hand. So really just needs to fill up that graveyard. At 18 life, she's doing well for herself, though. Oh, yeah, she has plenty of time here. Yeah, assuming that there's no secure the waste for five on Guy's next turn. Uh, though he does not have the ability to emblem Gideon at this time, so that's at least good. So that, that attack on Gideon might be more relevant than it seems. All right, let's go back over to Emma. Copy of Grim Horror Specs. Definitely a good one to play when you have an Antuko Husk out there. And then a swing here. Black will be from Seeker of the Way. Oh, my. 
And here comes a Stasis Snare. That's going to target an Antuco Husk. So the Sifter is going to be sacrificed to the Husk. And she'll draw, and the Husk will sacrifice to itself. So a pair of kills here for Guy, but because of Nantuko Husk, there's no lifelink. Um, and Emma gets to draw cards off both those. So despite the fact that it seems like he has two kill spells, not much was accomplished there. Right. On the board, it looked like a good swing for Guy, but uh, Emma's also playing with her graveyard. You notice that she has already drawn a Rally of the Ancestors, so we are building up to something big here. <laughs> yeah, I see Guy asking there just what cards are in, in her graveyard. So, so far... We have an Antuco Husk, we have a Jace, we have a Sadisi's Faithful, we have a Catacomb Sifter. Noticeably, Emma only has one white mana at this point in time, uh, so if a rally is going to occur, it's going to have to come off of another land, but it's still something that you absolutely should have on your radar here. Yeah, certainly the namesake card of the deck, something that guy is aware of, as now the Planeswalkers will start to hit in harder. It's a copy of Obnixilis Reignited. This Planeswalker, powerful. I think black-white control, the deck we see it out of the most, really. A full three copies of it. It's going to go ahead and take care of Emma's last creature. And you see Gideon plussing up, swinging in here for a full nine damage. Guy wanting to end this game before Emma can find the second white. Oh, yeah. He knows what kind of pressure that he's under here. You see some anticipation from Emma, hoping, rubbing hands there, hoping to get that second white mana. I think both players know what she's building toward. Uh, it's not the white mana, but it might work. It's a copy of Collected Company. Maybe that can keep her alive for another turn? Yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of good cards you can find off of Company, obviously. Certainly some creatures that uh, help you filter your draws further. If there's a Catacomb Sifter or possibly a Horror Specs plus another creature. I think I saw an Antuco Husk there in the two cards that she grabbed. Uh, not the most exciting card on this board. Yeah, it looks like it's me, Nantuko Husk, and Sadisi's Faithful. Now, there's concern if she's doing this main phase with... Why would she be doing main phase with Collected Company? I mean, one of the things I'm worried about is that uh, if she had done this during Guy's attack next turn, she could unsummon the Gideon with the Sadisi's Faithful. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why main phase is the time to do this. It's possible uh, because you see a polluted delta out of Guy, you might think that the deck is Esper. Could be playing around... Uh, playing around counter spells. Yeah. Uh, he did have Dispel mana at that point in time, though Dispel is not the only, ma only main deckable counter. It could be something like a main deck Disdainful Stroke, which is not entirely insane. Yeah, I suppose if you're not sure if they're on Black White... If they're on Esper, if you're putting your opponent on Esper control, that play makes a ton of sense. Mm-hmm. Also, she could try to find, like, an Elvish Visionary. She elected not to play the Visionary in her hand, but if she Visionaried into Evolving Wilds, the only way to get the white mana to play a, a Rally on the next turn would be to play the Evolving Wilds on her own turn. Yeah, that one actually makes a lot of sense. Um, rally a deck with so many sequencing plays to it. So we go back now, the question will be, first, can Emma survive to next turn? After that, can she find the white to rally the ancestors? And we see murderous cut on the step there on the faithful, and an utter end on the Nantuko husk. Emma's not going to get another chance at that white mana, and game one will go over to Guy Scott. Mm -hmm. And like you said, with his five creature deck, he had a lot of different removal spells that he could have found to close that game there. Yeah, so close on here, Guy up 1-0 as we will go ahead and move over to the sideboards for the players. So starting on Guy Scott's side, today he has one copy of Kalidas Trader of Get, three Monastery Mentors, two Dispels, two Negates, a Narset Transcendent, three Duress, a Flaying Tendrils, an Infinite Obliteration, and a Planar Outburst. What do we like in this matchup? Dispel and Negate are slam dunk cards here. You're both concerned about Collected Company and Rally of the Ancestors. Um, they are more reliable than Duress in actually getting those cards uh, and countering them from Emma instead of hoping that it's there when you cast Duress. Flying Trent Tendrils is interesting. It is uh, presumably better against Emma's wrist list than lists that play a lot of Ailies. Uh, so there's more two toughness creatures. I think that you bring it in one way or the other and it might be more impactful here. Uh, Infinite Obliteration is kind of meh. Uh, sometimes, some players like it a lot, some players don't. Um, you can pick a creature out of their deck, which is, it can be nice, uh, but it depends on how they sideboard, really. Uh, a lot of Rally players like to trim numbers against black decks because they know that the infin Infinite Obliteration might be coming and they'll just try to beat you on the board. It's interesting. We see an infinite obliteration out of Jeskai Black decks where they have the opportunity to Soulfire Grandmaster it back to Jace and cast it a second time. Now, Bla Guy's deck doesn't have the ability to do, to do that. So if you only have the ability to cast obliteration once in a game, uh, 
is that enough? Or are we really looking for multiple obliterations? I um, have to imagine you're looking for multiple copies. One copy is pretty good against decks like Eldrazi Ramp. Not so exciting against Four Color Rally, especially if they just happen to have one of the cards that you care about in play. Yeah. But All right, on Emma's side, she has an... I an Eilie, three Anafenzas, a Hallowed Moonlight, a Dispel, two Arish and Clerics, a Grim Horror Specs, two Murder's Cut, two Duress, a Merciless Executioner, and a Fleshbag Martyr, the 1-1 one -one split of those guys. Definitely. So I th Emma has a few options here to go a more controlling route and to play a little more interactive magic with Guy. Uh, the Dispel will play off of Guy's counters, in addition to just countering some removal spells if we end up playing just a ground game. Uh, Grim Horror Specs draws some extra cards, seems great. Duress much better for Emma than it is for Guy. Guy just has a lot of non-creature spells, whereas Emma has just a couple that you have to be able to cherry pick. All right. Well, we'll be underway shortly. Game two here. Black White controlled by Guy Scott versus Emma Handy. Now, one thing we've been talking about is the Star City Games Regional Championships. They're now just on our doorstep. Coming up next weekend, that we have Modern Championships. That's on February 6th. You see here, this is the Ascent of Aya playmat. This playmat and token will give, be given to the first 200 players at each event for free. Now, this is also part of our SCG Tour for 2016. So you will be awarded SCG points along with qualifications for our next Invitational to all players in the top eight. So you see a lot of prizes here, a lot of points available at them. I know I myself, I'm planning to come out and battle this. I'm not sure about you. Yeah, I am planning to pre-register. If I were more on top of my affairs, <laughs> I would already be pre-registered. This tournament seems great. I'm excited. Yeah, see here the locations listed here on the screen. Remember, this is going to be the modern regional championship. So I'm going to have to find a new deck. I actually have a new deck. It's going to be fun, though. Yeah, well, you're, yeah, you're not, know, you're not I, just going to play. I can't just play uh, Summer Bloom. They didn't ban Amulet of Vigor. You I could just play Amulet of Vigor. That's true. That's true. I mean, the best, we always talked about the best draws out of Amulet were the ones that didn't need Summer Bloom when you just drew three Amulets in the opener. Mm -hmm. That was the best one. So hey. I should just do that and show up with it. Yeah. You have to run <laughs> good to win a tournament anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. No, so find out more. February 6th, the Star City Games Regional Champs. But <laughs> now you yourself, you're more of a Delver player when it comes to modern. I love me a Delver of Secrets. Uh, the card is at its worst by format in modern. Uh, make no mistake about that. I play it even when it's bad. I don't care. Love the card. Uh, board it out a lot, but I'll still main deck it every time. All right, go here for game two. Emma will be on the play. Four Color Rally, a deck that our last weekend for most of the Gatewatch, I think really establishing itself as the deck to beat in the format. The of all the new the decks, the new inclusions of Reflector Mage, just looked brilliant in the deck all weekend. I mean, there you you know this for example, Four Color Rally used to have a very close matchup with Obs on Aggro, and I I have to imagine that that's just not the case anymore. Oh yeah, it's skewed heavily by the presence of Reflector Mage. And also, the nice thing about the Mage is that it plays well no matter what direction the game is going. If you're just playing a regular game of Magic and attacking with creatures, Reflector Mage is a fantastic tempo play, and then it has, just has this come into play ability, which happens to be great with Rally the Ancestors. The card is just perfect for the deck. Uh, the best performing version of Abzan, although there was two Abzan decks in the top eight. Uh, there was a Collective Company one, but then there was also just the Abzan blue deck that played its own Reflector Mages. The, the yeah, card's just excellent. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to be interesting, right? You you see that when a format first comes out of one deck starts to play a card. Remember this when, uh, when the two mana J started, you know? There were just a couple decks that played it, and then suddenly we started realizing this card's great, and it wasn't just it wasn't just Jeskai playing it anymore. Then suddenly we said, well, mate, wait. Maybe we should play it in Rally. Maybe we should play it in Esper Dragons. And then suddenly, you know, it eventually changed the format. And I'm wondering whether we'll see something like that with Reflector Mage. When multiple archetypes start picking up a card, you know that there's something good going on. Absolutely. We have yet to see, at least to my knowledge, a Jeskai deck playing the card. It's certainly within the realm of possibility. Yeah, something like Seeker of the Way backed up by Reflector Mage, that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Both players here on six. Looks like a keep on side on both sides. So there will be a scry. For Emma, it looks like a decent six card hand, maybe slow out of the gates, but does have a copy of both Collected Company and Rally the Ancestors. Mm, decided to keep her top card, but it does not appear that she's in love with it. <laughs> that scry can be can be so difficult, right? Because you, you look at top card and you if you know it's a it's a weak draw. It's almost like you're, you're consigning yourself to that fate. Yeah, she does have a fetch land in her hand, you know, so she could just leave it on top of fetch. It is another fetch land that she actually kept on top, so 
just uh, prioritizing mana here. Well, it makes sense. If you have a hand that's light on creatures but has those big payoff instants, I could see I see the appeal of keeping another land there. Yeah, not getting to four with a collected company in your hand is not ideal. Well, her turn two play will be Elvish Visionary. My favorite card in the deck. Big fan of Elvish Visionary. Love me an Elvish Visionary. I'm not even an Elves <laughs> player. I'll just put it in a deck. Replaces itself. That's called it's value. All, it's all upside. Yeah. Attacks for one, two. Attacks, look at this. Look at this. It's getting in. Uh, Emma correcting herself, getting uh, the creatures and where they belong in front of in the front lands. Of the lands. I always, I always used to play them behind my lands. I like the idea that they had to cross terrain to get to my opponent. <laughs> <laughs> I had actually yeah. never thought about it that way before. Uh, I just thought of it in the way that your lands are the least relevant cards in play, so why would you put them closer to your opponent? Well, okay, so the reason I always had my lands in front is I had, when I first learned to play, I had this layout play mat that you were supposed to play on, and it was like, you know, made really cheap, like, plasticky thing. And it told you to put the lands in front. It had the zones they had for each of them. You know, the lands are right up at the top of the table, so. You got to be an innovator, Matthias. <laughs> put your creatures where you want to put them. Just turn, ignore what the playmat says. Yeah, the playmat's not your boss. It's not your master. Turn three, Catacomb Sifter from Emma. She did swing in for one there, putting guy to 18. Yep, excellent curve here. Another creature generating some value. Yeah, it looks like we're off to the races here. Enough mana for Collected Company. Now, she is on zero white mana with that Rally of the Ancestors in hand. That is awkward. At this stage of the game, we're pretty far from wanting to cast the card, though. So it's not all bad. Well, and that's one of the interesting parts. A lot of times from Rally, we see the deck uh, really just do... Beat down with two threes and one ones. Yep. That's how you got to start the game, and then that makes it pretty easy for Zulaport Cutthroat to clean up. All right, well, here's a swing for two. It'll put Guy to 16. Draw was another polluted Delta from Emma. She's got to be aware of counter spells. She plays that one, but it looks like she'll lead off with Duress. So we'll see what guys were sitting on. So we see some good play here. A negate, so she now knows about the counter magic. Yep. Copy of Obnixilis, Reignited, a Kalidus, an Utter End, and a Swamp. Yeah, she was fishing for a Dispel, but finding the gate is also great. Getting that out of uh, Guy's hand, definitely important. Not for this turn, but for the rest of the game. It does go ahead and take care of the negate. It leaves a copy of Obnixilis Reignited. Now, that's card not as much of a concern, but we see here Kalidus Trader of Get. That's been one of the things that it'll be interesting to see just how many people are playing this because of the prevalence of Rally. That first ability, the same that Anna Fenza has, is no joke against the Rally deck. Oh, absolutely not. And even better than Anna Fenza, the fact that it makes a 2-2 zombie every time it triggers makes it very easy to actually just make it lights out for Rally, not just shutting off their game plan, but also just killing them. Yeah, it turns around in a hurry. So the swing will be to put Guy down to 15. There's no second play after the duress from Emma. Guy continuing to develop, to develop his mana base, getting Prairie Stream. I think there was some decision for him here as to whether or not he wanted to get basic number two because he has a swamp in his hand, mm -hmm. or whether he just wants to get all the duels now. And I actually like the decision that Emma made here. I believe I saw a collected company in her hand, and she knows that Guy has Kalidus. So I believe that the plan is to company on Guy's end step after he casts Kalidus, try to find a Reflector Mage, get that in his hand. Oh, wow. Yeah, so if he finds a Asadis is Faithful or a, or a Reflector Mage, then she gets Guy's turn in addition to getting the two creatures. Right. It does cost her the Scion token to make this play, uh, where she could have, you know, played the company main phase instead of duressing. But I really do like the upside. I agree with you here. Yeah, and I think that not casting that duress would uh, be a little greedy. <laughs> Probably. And here will be the traitor yep. of Get. Yep, as scripted, we see Kalidus. And uh, not surprising that Emma is reaching for her Scion. Here we go, Scion sacrifice. Four mana, collected company. And here we go. Six creatures. The very top one, I believe, a Reflector Mage. I think I saw a checklist card, too. This could be a good turn for her. I, I assume that this is Jace. And, uh... <laughs> Jace runs for... Well, we'll confirm. Could, could be Liliana. But no, it's going to be Jace and Reflector Mage bouncing Cletus. A huge turnaround for Emma on the end step there. And you see five cards in the graveyard. She already has enough to flip the Jace. She could collect a company again this turn if she wanted. Oh, yeah. I like that play a lot. Interesting. So a loot here. Jace finds another walker. 
It's going to discard it, and he'll flip. She's got some flashback options. Another, she could re recast the Collected Company. Also could duress again if she wants to get that Obnixilis out of Guy's hand. Yeah, Obnixilis is not a particularly threatening card for Emma's deck. Uh, the minus three to kill a creature, she already has Rally the Ancestors in her hand. I don't think that that's too threatening. Um, if the duress could hit the Kalidus, absolutely, I think that that would be a consideration. But the company just does more to the game state here. Well, here is the second collected company, and it's going to be another Planeswalker and a Zulaport Cutthroat. Yeah, Cutthroat's going to make it uh, a lot easier to close this game out. No Sacrifice Outlet at this point in time, but at least the removal spells will trigger it, assuming that they're not Exile effects. Well, guy, so play from Guy here. Deciding now between Obnixilis and Kalidus. One thing I like about the black-white control deck is those cards are very powerful. They stand alone, you know, Stasis Snare, great kill spell, Gideon, very good. But when you get to this point, you do feel like guys locked into basically one spell a turn here. And with the number of axes Emma's firing on, it's, it's going to be hard for him to keep pace. Definitely. And some of his options to cast two spells are three mana draw spells that lose him life. Yeah, I mean, he's already at 12 from taking hits. So three life, certainly not a freebie to give away. So we'll start with Silkrap. Silkrap will... Wrap up the Zulaport Cutthroat. Three I'll mana up, and he passes. Like that play a lot. Get that off the board before there's a chance to sacrifice it for a potential rally to bring it back, and uh, just deal with it even on this board. Here's a swing for three. Guy will take go to nine. Now, he only has single white up, so no potential for stasis snare here. Looks like Emma will just pass. Another copy of Collected Company in her hand. Yep, no reason to be casting that just now. Um, Scott, again, will have the option to play uh, Kalidus. Uh, from when Emma duressed Scott, there's no uh, counter magic hanging out over there that she's aware of anyway, so no real reason to be too aggressive with the yeah. company. Well, at a certain point, I think if Scott is, has to leave up his mana for a potential negate, I would think that that's a win in Emma's book because of how far ahead she is on the board right now. That's definitely a factor. There's also the potential for Scott to have a sweeper, be it flaying tendrils or languish. So just having collected company up for the end of the turn is pretty big in that situation as well. So Guy will pass turn end step. Emma will go for collected company, and that one's going to resolve. Six more cards here. Nantuko Husk among them. And I think and, that may uh, be the only one. Five non-creatures among them as well. Husk is a great find here, though. Yeah, I mean, you'd be disappointed to only find one, but the one she found is good enough that I don't think it matters. If you had to pick one, that would probably be the one. So we go back to Emma's turn. She has an untap. Guy pauses on the upkeep, then just goes ops to let her draw. Maybe wanted to kill a creature then, but decides against. As it stands, five power in play for Emma. Her Planeswalker on three. Mm -hmm. And which does have another Collective Company and Duress. <laughs> I don't know how many Collective Companies you want to resolve in one game, but... As many as possible. As many as, <laughs> as, many as possible, as fast as possible. Yes, yeah, thought about activating Jace, realized that she can use the other Jace to flashback a spell first. No reason to leave that value on the table. She'll give Collective Company flashback here. And it will be cast again. First card there was a Zulaport Cutthroat. Again, a very good find. I mean, when you have the Husk, that's the piece you're looking for. We see Catacomb Sifter and Zulaport Cutthroat in play. Trigger on to make a Scion. We'll see if Guy lets her put the 1-1 one -one into play. Guy's been posturing a lot. You have to imagine there's some kind of removal spell. So I'd be surprised if Emma went too crazy about activating uh, the Nantuko Husk here. Well, she, the, the, the issue here is she doesn't really need to, right? Uh, if she gets a hit in with just the five, cre five power worth of creatures that she has on the board, then the cutthroat's lethal. Yep. So you see, in response, the first priority that guy gets is with that catacomb sifter trigger on the stack, trying to make a scion. So guy will use utter end to exile the Nantuko husk, which Emma will have it sacrificed to itself. 
So guys drained for one from Zulport Cutthroat. He's down to eight. Going to see three more coming his way in a second here. Sifter makes the Scion. Here's a swing for three guys at five. And this is the danger spot. He's at five life. Emma has five creatures and a Zulaport Cutthroat in play. Now, because he took care of the Nantuko Husk, she can't sacrifice them immediately. But Guy's going to have to get rid of these. He's going to have to exile the Cutthroat or, or get rid of it somehow before he can do anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not even sure what possible configuration of cards he could have to save himself on five here. Uh, that's just a extremely precariously low life total. Lifelink in Kalidus is not bad. No, Kalidus is a start. But you're thinking he might need a Silk Wrap for the Cutthroat in addition to this? Yeah. Um, getting the Cutthroat out of play seems very important from this stage. Even with the Kalidus, you know, there's that backup Jace there. That's going to start generating Emma some value. Sidisi's Faithful, she has kept in her hand, I think, just for this situation. Here's Ooh. the second Cutthroat. Yeah, I, I have to imagine that this game is over. And here's Sidisi's Faithful. This should do it. You see, she's actually can sacrifice. If she sacrifices the Scion here, it, the drain still happens because mm -hmm. it's a token creature. Good interaction there. So that will drain Guy down to three. He picks up the Cletus, looks at the board, and he'll pick up the rest of his cards. Emma Handy evens it up at one game apiece. And you saw the look in her eye when the camera panned her. It was the you're dead right look. <laughs> An impressive display there by Four Color Rally. Um, I mean, we were singing his praises before, but just how good is Reflector Mage right now? It's so good. <laughs> that, <laughs> the, to me, the deciding point of the game there is when Guy taps out for a turn four Kalidus and end step, Emma collected companies into Reflector Mage and then another card. And then you, you just feel like he was never coming back from it at that point. No. By design, Kalidus is supposed to be Guy's haymaker. Right? He puts that in the play, and it's like, this card's great against you. It, uh, yeah, it impacts you. Yeah, it interacts with your strategy extremely favorable for me. And then just a card that they're happy to have in their main deck takes care of it very easily. Yeah, they have this card in the main deck. And then the fact that she got to end step the Reflector Mage, so on Guy's next turn, he couldn't recast it. That also seems so relevant. Absolutely. Massive tempo play. That's no play. It's, and especially against a deck with so few creatures. Kalidus may be Guy's only... I believe maybe his only creature post board in the main deck. He just plays a copy of Kalidus and Force Seeker of the Ways. I would be surprised if Seeker is still in the deck at this point. Mm. There is some appeal to Monastery Mentor. Uh, I didn't discuss that before. It uh, is the best way to generate a clock, which does matter against a deck like Rally. It is true. I mean, and you, you can count on Rally to generally not kill your creatures also. Uh, and in matchups where you have against a removal light opponent, Monastery Mentor does have a lot of appeal. Mm -hmm. And if they're using Reflector Mage against Monastery Mentor, that means that they don't have it up if you have Kalidus as well. So we're going to get ready for game number three here between Emma Handy and Guy Scott. Now, on the Open Series this year, we are in Season 1. That means if you make your way out to any of our Season 1 Opens you see here on the tour, we, Cincinnati, Charlotte, and Atlanta in the books. We are here in Columbus with our regional championships next weekend, but making to any of the other ones in season one. So we have a Louisville Open, Philadelphia, Indianapolis again, and then Baltimore following up to our Columbus Invitational at the end of April. Uh, we get, we, uh, you can come and compete in one of these tournaments. We have them in Modern and Legacy and Standard, depending on the format of your choice. Also, players will receive a copy of the Kitchen Links Season 1 playmat. So this is with entry to any of our Opens. And, you know, I'm not a Kitchen Finks player. I would say, <laughs> okay, that's not really my style. But uh, cats on just about anything I can think of is, is my pace. I'm, in fact, a hater of Kitchen Finks. I never leave home without aggressive answers to that card. Yeah, you're more of a Magma Spray player when you hear about Kitchen Finks. Absolutely. Love the art on that play, Matt, though. See, I love it when my opponents play Kitchen Finks because of... It's not very good against uh, Amulet Figure, is that what you're saying? It's not, you know, it's not good against Storm, <laughs> it's not good against Scape Shift, whatever I'm doing at the time. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can have a 3-2 with an incremental combat ability. That's great. That's I, be great. I believe that 22 is a finite life total. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you are dead. All right, well, Guy on the play with turn two, just two lands. It'll be Emma out of the gates first. She gets a turn two Jace off a pair of basics, so her battle ends will be set up for the rest of the game. However, still far away from that double white for, for Rally and doesn't have the green for company yet. Yeah, or, or the creatures in the graveyard for Rally, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of games well, still to be played. Yeah, well, we did see that, was it? It was last game. Uh, Emma never actually had the second white for a Rally, but it, it never mattered. No, she definitely had the single green for collected company, collected company, collected company. <laughs> We'll see whether Jace gets to survive to her untap. 
Well, the tap land here out of Guy uh, pretty much ensures at least the uh, end step survival. Let's see about the untap. Yeah, no disfigures hanging out. But the black-white deck is flush with removal. I'd be surprised if Emma gets to keep this Jace. Yeah. It would also just be an extremely good position for her. And a land and a pass, that is what's going to happen. Hmm. You got to wonder what uh, exactly is going on in Scott's hand at this point. Yeah, so if he doesn't have, I mean, the black white control deck does not have a lot of early plays, to be fair. Um, when we look at it, you know, with that Grasp of Darkness, he had game one. He only plays two of those. Seeker of the Way is normally his early play. That's not particularly strong here. But yeah, you're not wrong. It's gonna, so for Emma, it's going to be a Catacomb Sifter. Yeah. You see Guy fetching for a land to play tapped. I, I imagine it's pretty difficult to keep a hand that doesn't at least have a removal spell or a painful truce, right? You know, I, I, in this matchup, there's a lot of pressure on you, I think, to have a copy of Silk Wrap in your opener, mm -hmm. something like that. He does have a turn four play. It's going to be Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. Yeah. Gideon's not bad, though, uh, as your first play in this matchup. Yeah, you're right. It seems, I mean, he's already facing down a 2-3. Um, I don't see those allies getting through anytime soon. No. They'll, uh, they'll block that Catacomb Sifter if you want to, I suppose. Jace discards another copy of Jace. That's card number four in the graveyard. Emma can flip this turn if she cares to. And one thing I want to point out is I, I really like how Emma's done with her fetches here. She's fetched each turn. Now she's gotten a pair of basics and is now using fetch lands to set up the rest of her colors. On, on Guy's side, it's been a little more of a battle. He's been fetching battle lands on the end step every time, which while that means he has a lot of dual lands in play, he doesn't have double basic yet, which means he still could he runs the risk of having a come into play tapped land on turn five? Yeah, future battle lands. Uh, obviously, any future copy of any creature land, an additional shambling event would be coming into play. And there's no way around that one. Um, but there's definitely some real problems with Scott's tempo even going forward for turn four. Emma going to want making sure that she can play around a possible counter spell. Goes ahead and collected company's main phase. This hits an Antuko Husk and a Sadisi's Faithful. The Faithful will exploit itself to bounce the token. It's a good mix. Little shy of killing Gideon this turn. Yeah, you wish you had that fourth point. She only has three points of damage as it stands. So she'll put Gideon down to one, however. Yep. And pass. Once again, killing Gideon, not essential, but probably preferred. One thing I want to point out for Emma's side, by keeping that Jace in play, and not looting. She's actually playing around some good cards in Guy's deck. So Guy has copy, plays copies of Ruinous Path, which if she flipped the Jace into a Planeswalker and say plus it, Guy could Ruinous Path the Planeswalker. Now he can't actually path the Jace mm -hmm. because she'd flip it in response. And on her own turn, she'll be able to flip it and give that Collected Company flashback. So this is actually really going to pay off well for her. You know, Planar Outburst is a play from Guy. In response, Emma's going to activate the Jace. Yep, definitely solid there. And there was no real reason to flip it on her turn anyway. Yeah, I mean, well, you miss a chance at just a free plus one loyalty counter by not flipping it. So there is a cost. Yeah, but, there is a cost. But I think her, but I like the play nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't see it very often, and it's certainly not your A plan, but uh, ultimating Jace is not an unrealistic line. It's certainly not against a black-white control deck. So we play in her outburst from Guy. Given the fact that she already has collected company, though, I think she's more than happy to be flashing that one back. But good play here. Guy post-combat pluses the Gideon. He'll come in and brawl, and he'll take out Jace before he gives a chance, gets a chance to flash back. To be fair, that extra loyalty counter would have saved Jace from dying, though it's not super relevant just ticking up from one. So Emma will have to rebuild, and she'll do it with Elvish Visionary to start. That draws a copy of Collected Company. I'd say she's doing all right. And another a Catacomb Sifter. And this is the frustration of the Rally deck, right? You sweep all their creatures. And at the same time, she's still building toward her late game plan. Graveyard now has a Husk, a Sifter, a Jace, a Sadisi's Faithful. She has double white in play. Most of the pieces are in place. Yep. We're shy some number of Zulaport Cutthroat, but the, the position is far from bad. Kalidus, Trader to get. This is the play for Guy. He has another copy of Planar Outburst in hand. It's a good one. 
I spotted a Reflector Mage in Emma's hand earlier. I saw just how good that was against, you know, just about any 4-drop that doesn't have an Enter the Battlefield ability. Reflector Mage is just going to make them almost unplayable. Yeah, in the near future, we might be talking about a Reflector Mage test, similar to the old Jace the Mind Sculptor test. Yeah, I mean, I just don't feel like, I don't want to play, you know, Thunderbreak Regent. I don't want to play any Tap Out 4 into a Reflector Mage. You do get to at least Lightning Bolt them with the Regent. All right. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> sure. That's half of a Siege Rhino. That's fine. I would still play Siege Rhino in a Reflector Mage metagame. That's probably still OK. Yeah. That one is definitely on the positive side of the line. Here is the Reflector Mage. He will reflect the Kalidus back into Guy's hand. Catacomb Sifter coming at Gideon. So Guy can choose between the ally and the Planeswalker. The ally will loyally, <laughs> I believe, jump in front here. Guy does have a second Gideon in his hand. So he could really go either way on this block. Seems better to block than to not block, but not by much. And you spy that second planar outburst in Guy's hand. He may be setting up for outburst plus Gideon swing if he chumps here. Yeah, that makes the block a lot better, actually, if that's the line. So here's the chump block and a pass. And you see he's fetching. In response, Emma's going to collected company here. And I like that a lot as Guy, by fetching there, is taking down the gate. Yeah, uh, Emma is getting in under counter spells. She is not getting ahead of this planar cleansing. Yeah, I mean, Planar Outburst, not a card you normally see out of these decks. I mean, certainly not the second yeah, one. Yeah, the second copy. Uh, I, it might I, blindside her a I bit. would not yeah. expect the second copy. It is a Jeff Hoagland deck. And by, what I mean by that is what I really like about Jeff's designs is there are certain cards which Jeff is a big buyer in that most of the metagame is not. And when he buys into them, he buys into them big. You know, mm. It's not that Jeff wanted to put one up Nixilis in his deck. He has three. Uh, it's a concept called information asymmetry, and you want to know things that your opponent does for sure. That is a great thing to have in your deck. The Collected Company got a Elvish Visionary and a Catacomb Sifter. A lot of creatures in play. This is going to be a ton of scries for Emma if Guy goes for the Planar Outburst. And the danger here of all those scries is that he, she will be almost certain to draw a Rally of the Ancestors on the following turn if she doesn't already have one. Would you say that Guy is in the danger zone? I would. I think that could be said. So, I am. I, <laughs> somebody some, might. Somebody, somebody might. might say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not going to say that. Okay. All right. But if you look at the number of scries she has set up, look at this. It's eight, nine. She has ten scries. No, no wait. The, 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 it's, it's non-token. Okay. So we have eight scries set up. Eight's still a lot. Eight's a lot. And it's going to tap guy out if he goes for the sweeper. Yep. And their graveyard. I mean, there's no Zulu Park Cutthroat in it yet, but boy, does Rally look like something I don't want my opponent <laughs> to do right now. Yeah, then you get a lot of draws off of these Visionaries, a bunch more Scries. It'll be interesting to see how Guy plays it. Um, he's actually at 17, so what he'd like to do is get enough mana, I think, to Planar Outburst with Counter Spell up. And he might be able to build his way there, yep. but he's going to go for the Sweeper immediately. Yep, no, no real surprises there. So eight scry ones coming up. One, two, three. I mean, are you taking anything that's not named Rally here? Uh, probably not. Nice. There's a non-zero chance that you keep Collected Company, but probably not even until, like, the last two scries. A little beatdown action from Gideon. Looks like, like a little clarification on the text on Catacomb Sifter here, making sure that the scry number was correct. And it was, so no issues there. But all 10 went to the bottom here. So it's possible she missed. A lot of players are very happy when their opponent scries cards to the bottom. I personally interpret it differently. She just didn't draw 10 cards that she doesn't want. She, oh, she, got, yeah, she got to not draw those cards. I mean, they are. It, it's it's better that I think you'd be happier that she scried ten to the bottom than that she scried seven to the bottom and then went top, put the last next one on top. Mm. 
I mean, it does tell you that she you don't know that she hit Rally, but it's not good news. Saying no. that she's now, you know, the remaining cards in her deck that she has not scryed to the bottom, the density of rallies among them is, is pretty high now. Yeah. The the actual best case scenario is your opponent keeps a card on top, and then it turns out to be a card that you actually don't care about. So this is an interesting one. Emma played a copy of Jace and Zulaport Cutthroat. Guy with a Silk Wrap. Obstacle for the Jace. Now, if you're trying to build up to a combo finish, I feel like he needed to take the Cutthroat there. There's no Cutthroats in Emma's yard. Yeah, that uh, may have been a pretty serious tactical misstep. Cycling a Hollowed Moonlight here is not very exciting, so uh, looks like there's not going to be a punishment. She'll pass. Hollowed Moonlight in here. Now, remember, Emma clearly knowing this matchup that Guy's deck has wins with cards like Gideon and Secure the Wastes. So heads up sideboard plan there. But yeah, it does look like she hasn't found Rally yet. You do see in Emma's hand there's a copy of Dispel at the front. So in the case that she finds a Rally, she's set up to even win a counter war over it. Yeah, or at least fight one. But I think we may be in chump block mode here as well. Yeah, Gideon plus uh, Kalidus is lethal here. Gideon will plus up. And uh, Shambling Vent will join. Given the presence of Kalidus, that uh, Cutthroat's going to be exiled this way anyway. Another Shambling Vent. That one does look lethal, even yep. if she blocks the biggest creature. And Guy Scott in three takes it down, defeating Four Color Rally. And I have to say, that, that, that 10 scries missed. Yeah, I spoke pretty highly of scrying 10 to the bottom. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's just not very good. I mean, not uh, so just falling short. Uh, Emma Handy will pick up a round one loss. Yeah, she's uh, she knows this deck. It's a great deck. Uh, I have I have faith that she'll be able to rally back. So you know, <laughs> oh, it's oh, okay. uh, as much faith as Sidisi might. Someone might say that. Okay. 